Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, thank you to the uh, organizers, Colin, for every, everyone who's uh, keeping this thing running. Um, so today uh, I'm going to talk about this fairly broad topic, um, but to really uh, narrow the focus a bit, I'm going to start by making a statement which I think most of you will find controversial, um, and that I hope to convince you of by the end of the talk, and that is that it is plausible. Oh, sorry. Um, it is plausible that uh, galactic winds are weak. Um, so let's talk a little bit about galactic winds. Um, we don't know what launches them, and as far as I know, no one has proposed aliens, but uh, you never know. Uh, <laughs> um, the, real, the real categories are uh, supernova, radiation pressure, cosmic rays. Um, I'm going to be agnostic on this topic for the rest of the talk. Uh, but I just want to point out that we don't actually know what launches galactic winds. Uh, we also don't know how strong galactic winds are. So this is stellar mass versus the mass loading factor, the ratio of the outflow mass to the star formation rate. And these are three different uh, yeah, statements of what the mass loading factor should be as a function of mass. And you can see that there's at least one order of magnitude uncertainty, usually two, in what the value actually is. Testing. Hello? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so why do we so why do we think galactic winds uh, so despite the fact that we don't know what galactic winds are, we don't know how strong they are. We still, we're still pretty sure that they're real and that they're, they're significant in the evolution of galaxies. So why do we think that? Um, first up, we have this, uh, the ratio of stellar mass to halo mass. Uh, so the, star formation, the net star formation efficiency of galaxies. We can see that even at the peak, uh, you only get about a six of baryons that we think each, each of these halos should have turning into stars. Um, and even if you add in the gas, uh, the baryonic fractions is at most about a quarter. Um, so, so galactic winds are a good way to get rid of this gas and prevent star formation. Uh, separately, we can look at the metal content of galaxies, and you can see that, um, especially at low mass galaxies, especially at low masses, galaxies are missing a lot of metals. So, where are those metals? You can actually see them in the CGM. So. Uh, this is a plot of the carbon content of the CGM in green versus um, gas and stars in blue and red uh, for dwarf galaxies from, from the Cost Dwarf Survey. And the, the same is true at higher masses. Uh, in all these cases, the CGM is, a, is such a large reservoir of metals that it's comparable to or larger than the ISM and, and, the, and what's locked up in stars. So galactic winds are another a great way to get uh, metals out of galaxies and into the CGM. So one, one more point for galactic winds. Uh, another reason people like galactic winds is uh, this uh, equilibrium or bathtub sort of model. And the way this model works is that you just write down a very simple statement, which is that the net change in gas content in a galaxy is just equal to gas in minus gas out through these two sinks, star formation and outflows. You can combine these terms um, into something proportional to the star formation rate. And you get this very simple equation at the end. And this, this equation has an analytic solution, assuming that these two things vary sufficiently slowly. And that analytic solution is that this term has to equal this term. And they become equal on the time scale equal to T loss, which is just the depletion time divided by this prefactor. Um, 
And so, but in order to get this to work, you actually need very strong outflows. So this loss time again is the depletion time divided by the basically one half plus uh, the mass loading factor. Uh, the depletion time, however, gets very long as you go to dwarf galaxies. So in order to get this loss time to be shorter than the Hubble time, uh, which would appear as blue in this chart of redshift versus halo mass, if you have strong feedback, then, then this condition is satisfied pretty much everywhere. But if you have weak feedback, then dwarf galaxies aren't in equilibrium. And that would be unfortunate because uh, then you, you wouldn't have these nice relationships for the star formation rate, the gas mass, and the metallicity, which we think are nice ways of explaining the scaling relations in these quantities. Of course, there are other uh, scaling relations besides these, uh, quite a few others, not just these. Um, and to explain all of them, you want a model that's uh, more sophisticated than the equilibrium model. Uh, and also one that's sufficiently flexible and parameterizable that you can quickly explore parameter space. So I happen to have such a model, uh, and the way it works is as follows. You take uh, a galaxy and divide it into concentric annuli, logarithmically spaced. And in these annuli, you solve these among other equations. Uh, so these equations are actually fairly straightforward. These are just conservation of mass of gas and stars, uh, conservation of energy, conservation of metals, conservation of angular momentum. Um, and you, you know, evolve these forward, and as you can imagine, there are quite a few parameters that go into controlling these equations. Uh, and just to give you, just to give you a uh, feel for what sort of calculation this code is actually doing, uh, I'm showing you just as an example, the metallicity profiles as a function of radius for a sample of galaxies evolving from redshift four to redshift zero. Um, just to tell you that you know, something is happening here. Um, okay, so at this point, I've told you there's a lot of data and I have a model. So uh, ideally what happens next is that we apply Bayes' theorem, uh, which is how you uh, update, your update your beliefs about the parameters in the model, uh, uh, given, given your prior beliefs, beliefs about, about the parameters, and, and by, by comparing the, the data to the model. Unfortunately, Unfortunately in this particular case, uh, this is prohibitively expensive. And the reason is that the model is fast, but it's not that fast. It takes five minutes to maybe an hour to run the model, depending on the exact values of the parameters. Um, and you have to run the model a lot of times to uh, do an MCMC. Uh, so the way we get around this is that we don't actually need the full model results uh, to compare to the data. We only need sort of a handful of values. And so as long as we can approximate these values in a reasonable way, we can uh, go much, much faster well, time scale. And if you'll excuse my terrible Photoshop, uh, we can then proceed despite uh, the skepticism of Reverend Bayes. Okay, so, so the way this works uh, is the way, we, the way we approximate all these parameters that we need for the likelihood is we, as usual, we define a prior on the uh, parameters, on the physical parameters in the model. And then we draw, uh, say, 10,000 samples from that prior. For each one of these, we run a simulation. So this is a little bit expensive, but, but doable. It's much cheaper than doing the full MCMC. Then with all these examples, uh, for every parameter that we're interested in, say stellar mass at redshift 0, 1, 2, and 3, effective radius at 0, 1, 2, and 3, um, we apply a machine learning method called a random forest. Uh, and we take these 10,000 examples for which we know the input parameters and this output parameter. And we, we train these models. And then we get a, a way to quickly approximate what this value is for any new value of theta. So then explicitly, at the end, we have, we, this, this is what I'm actually doing. Uh, this is the set of parameters that I'm using. Uh, you can see there's a fair number of them. Um, and then in, a, in addition, there's a, the hidden parameter of the, the actual accretion history that I'm putting into each of these models. Um, and that, that's taken into account in, in the fitting. 
so, so given given a value of this theta, um, we use the random forest to compute these quantities at these redshifts, and then we use these quantities to compare to the data in a likelihood function. Uh, and the only difference between this and just regular MCMC is that we're using a random forest at this step instead of running a new model. So it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so this is what happens when we actually run the model. So each of these panels is a histogram of the posterior of each of these parameters. Um, and the green line is the prior for comparison. And you can see that, uh, you know, sometimes the, the data really does inform the prior uh, and you get something that's quite different. Other times, not so much. Uh, nonetheless, uh, what we end up with is you know, a full distribution of parameters. And what we can do, since we've made a lot of approximations, we want to go back and check, uh, do we end up with a reasonable answer? And so one thing we can do is we can take uh, this blue bar, which uh, shows you an estimate for the posterior mode, i.e. the single most likely set of parameters, uh, and then re-simulate those galaxies. So I'm showing you some, some parts of that here. So the way to read this, uh, plot is each row is a different relation. Uh, there, there are other relations that we're comparing to, but this is just a, a subset. Um, the points here are the re-simulated galaxies. The uh, colored bars are the uh, data to which we're, we're comparing them and were actually used in the fit. Um, and yeah, and, and so the the end result that you get, the, the, I mean, the impression I want you to take away from this plot is that this fit is reasonable despite all the approximations that we've made. Um, so returning now to the question of mass loading factor, I told you at the beginning I was gonna say that it's plausible that the mass loading factor is not very large in galaxies. And this is what I mean. Um, so these are the three lines I showed you before for the mass loading factor as a function of mass. And these are the predictions in this re-simulated set of galaxies for the mass loading factor. These are, the colors are different redshifts. And what you can see is that the mass loading factor is usually quite low, um, except you know, at the very lowest masses in, in, in this sample. Um, okay, so this, this raises a few questions, one of which is, if, if the mass loading factor is not the thing which is controlling the galaxies, what is? And we actually have a nice way of evaluating that. So we go back to our library of n examples and example galaxies that we've already run. And we can split these into a training and a test set, uh, as is usual in machine learning. For the training set, we train a model. Uh, so we've you know, already done this step. In the test set, what we can do is we can take the, uh, the features, the, the, I mean, we can take the features, we can run through the model and make a prediction, and then we can compare that to the known values of those quantities. And um, in the end, you, you get uh, like an R squared or something that tells you how good, uh, how good this model is at, at actually recovering the values in your test set. Now what you can do is for each feature, one at a time, you can chain, you can swap the values around, you can shuffle the values before you send it into the prediction. And then you can see how much that shuffling makes, uh, makes the model worse. If the shuffling doesn't matter, uh, or if, if, if you compare the results at the end and the prediction is about the same as it was before, that means that that, that parameter was not very important. However, if the model is now much worse at, pre at predicting the known values, um, then that parameter is very important. And so we can quantify this and, and a giant table. Um, so this is a small subset of that. So for each observable parameter, uh, observable variable, um, we can say what is the most important uh, physical parameter, what's the second most important, et cetera, et cetera. And the colors just correspond to the, the different possible features. So blue means halo mass at redshift zero, uh, tan means this alpha r parameter, et cetera. And the, the intensity just shows you how large the number is. Um, and what you can see immediately from this is that halo mass at redshift zero is often quite important, and that, that's expected. But what I didn't expect was that this alpha r parameter would often be the most important parameter, even more important than the halo mass at redshift zero. 
and that parameter is the parameter that controls the radial accretion distribution. Okay, so uh, that's about it. Uh, the conclusions are, uh, one, random forests are great. Uh, two, the distribution of accreting gaps is incredibly important, and um, I don't think it's been measured very well in cosmological simulations, so I think people with access to cosmological simulations should measure it. Um, and finally, it is plausible you can get a good fit to the data uh, by having a model that has uh, galactic winds that are weak. Yes, okay, so the, the two most important variables are the halo mass at redshift zero, it's just uh, the, and, I mean, this, this is not a surprise, it controls the depth of potential well, um, and indirectly a number of other parameters, including the accretion rate. So uh, the other parameter is alpha r, and that is just the ratio of the scale length of the accretion to the virial rate race. So implicit in the model is the assumption that the, that the gas comes in in an exponential profile, uh, and this parameter just controls the size of that exponential profile. Correct. Correct. Yes, uh, I agree that that would be a good step. At the moment, my approach has been to try to fit with this data and then compare at the end to uh, IFU data um, because I, I have a better feeling for sort of the selection effects that go into the integrated data. Uh, but, uh, but it would, it would be, be good to talk to someone, someone who actually knows something about IPs. <laughs> well, it's not totally clear how to do that. Um, uh, I have done the exercise of just looking at how much mass has been lost from the galaxy, how much metals, uh, and comparing that to the CGM masses. Uh, and okay, well, the metals do recycle in this model, uh, so maybe that that accounts. Okay, uh, the other the other factor is that Zahid is assuming that uh, there's no preferential metal ejection, and that is allowed as well. So that's part of what's going on. Right. right. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So, so where? So, your question is basically, where is this mass actually in this model? And the answer is that it's all largely at large radii, and it's largely ionized. Um, so that that's part of what's happening. Well, it gets there through the large exponential uh, disk. I, in terms of in terms of the model, I, I don't know physically if that's reasonable. I'm sort of agnostic on that point. Maybe one last question. How well the Yeah, I didn't show that. It's, I mean, it's about the same quality as, as the other fits I showed. It's, it's reasonable but not perfect. Yes. Yes. yes.